In 1066, three kings ruled England. One was Harold Godwinson, one was Edward the Confessor, and one was William the Conqueror. This is an embroidery I done that took me 26 years, dedicated to my wonderful father, who's always given me inspiration. England, although it had been invaded, had never been conquered until William the Duke of Normandy came to England in 1066 to claim the throne. The following embroidered pictures explains why and how William became King of England. In 1064, Edward the Confessor was a good king. He ruled on the throne, but he had no children. So he asked his brother-in-law, Harold Godwinson, to go to Normandy to tell William the Conqueror that if he died, the throne was his. Here we see Harold leaving for the coast at Bosham. He has a prayer in his local church before he sets sail and they wait for the correct winds and the correct sea. Here you see that the sea and the winds are correct. So they sail over to France, but there was a big storm, wind, adverse weather conditions, and they crashed on the coast of France. And here we see Count Widow seeing Harold as a good source of income, because in those days they could kidnap rich people and ask for a good ransom if they're to be released. So here we see him being arrested. He's taken back to Count Guy's house where he demands a ransom be paid. But behind the pillow we see a spy, an English spy, who manages to escape to Harold's palace uh, and tell him that Harold has come over to see him. Harold, uh, sorry, to William's palace. William demands his release, or he might have paid the ransom. Here we see the two great men meeting together and Harold passes on the message that Edward the Confessor wants to tell him. Over the next year, the two become very, very good friends because William the Conqueror is not sure he wants to release Harold. Even though he's free to come and go, he's not free to return back to England. So over the next year, they come good friends. That they even, he even helps William the Conqueror fight a few of his battles and get rid of a few of his uh, enemies. And here we see uh, where they kill off um, Duke Conan, who thought he had claim to the throne too. And William the Conqueror is so impressed that he gives arms to Harold. Um, this is equivalent to giving a knighthood, but William was already already knew that Harold was um, a knight. So maybe he's making a promise uh, that Harold should serve underneath him. That night they celebrate, they have party, and um, they all get drunk. And here in the next scene, it's very, very important, you see Harold um, swearing on sacred relics that he will obey and follow William the Conqueror's rules. Now William's got everything he wants, he lets Harold go back to England. And here he is sailing back to England and straight away he jumps on his horse and he goes straight to Edward the Confessor and tells him, we think he tells him everything that happens but we're not quite sure. But that couple of months later in 1066, uh, just um, in the new year, we see Edward the Confessor on his deathbed and then he dies. But on his deathbed, he suddenly sits up and he says to Harold Godwinson, I leave you my kingdom and my wife uh, to look after. Here he gets taken to the famously built St Peter's, which now we call Westminster Abbey. It's just newly been built and the hand of God comes down to bless the, the Abbey. The 
local council um, don't want a foreigner on the throne. They want an Englishman, so they offer the crown and the axe to Harold, meaning they're offering the throne of England. And he stands there thinking, should I really take it? Should I go against William the Conqueror's rules? And he does, he takes it. Here he sits, Harold the Second, King of England. But that same year, the comet come over and they're known as Ailey's Comet and those days the people were very very suspicious they thought what's going on have we bought bad luck should he have claimed the throne of England and a spy then sails back to England and tells William the Conqueror that he's claimed the throne um, another spy comes back and tells Harold that he's heard rumours that boats are being built and there could be an invasion. And in the next scene, you see uh, William the Conqueror uh, at his council meeting, very, very angry. He knows he's entitled to the throne in England. So he quickly musters up uh, an army of all sorts all over Europe, mercenaries, whoever will fight for him with promises of lots of rewards if they fight for him and they win so here we see them chopping down trees craftsmen's gathered uh, building ships that could carry horses as well and on the next scene you'll see him taking the ships down to the sea in the next scene you see him loading up their ships with armor wine spears swords and also horses. William goes down to the coast and makes sure that all goes well. The sea is um, and the winds for the late September were pretty rough but he waited and waited then all of a sudden the sea and the winds were correct so he loaded all his ships and he sailed comfortably over to England and landed in Pensavy. Here you see them unloading their ships, but there was no English army to meet them. So they raid the local town, they send a few scouts out to look just in case it's a trap, but they find no one. So they pick up all the booty, food, drink that they can get their hands on and they have a party. They eat, drink and make merry that they've made a successful landing. But William is not quite sure what's going on. So he calls his brothers over to um, put a plan together, put a plan together to um, what they're to do, what their next move is. And the next demand is to put some um, Mott and Baileys together. These are small buildings where they can put lookouts uh, um, in case there's an invasion army. Now, you may wonder why there was no English to meet William. Well, Harold did have his men down on the coast, but he waited and he waited and he expected William the Conqueror to come over in the summer. But no. And his men demanded they go back to their farms because they needed to bring in their crops, otherwise they'd starved. So he let them go and thought maybe William would come the following year. But then he gets news that Yorkshire had been invaded by Harold Hadrada, a Viking king. The next scene shows you how Harold Hadrada gets pulled in onto the this part of the embroidery. Harold Godwinson's brother was an evil, nasty duke who was kicked out for his nastiness and his ruling. And in anger, he goes to Harold Hadraja and says, why don't me and your army get together, knock out Harold and I can rule under your name. And Harold Hadraja says, yeah, okay. So he gets all these Vikings together and he sails over to Yorkshire. And here we see um, a battle going on. But just before this battle, uh, he did 
invade and take the local town. Um, when Harold got up there, he'd done a surprise attack and it was called the Battle of Stanford Bridge. Both have been the most vicious battle on record where only a few Viking ships were needed to take what was left of the Viking army. Then Harold receives news that William the Conqueror had actually landed in down on the south coast. Instead of letting his men rest after a vicious battle, he gets them all together and walks them back south again. They're tired, they're worn and they're injured and a lot of his generals and leaders had already died in the Battle of Stamford Bridge. But he knows if he gets down there perhaps he can do a surprise attack and pick up men on the way. In the next scene you get a scout telling William the Conqueror that Harold is on his way down. So William gets ready, he gets ready to get on his steed. He then puts all his men on their horses, he actually has a cavalry, uh, as a cavalry army as well as an army of um, arrow shooters uh, as well as um, an infantry. Here you see William with his staff um, telling his men to make charge. And here you have Harold with his men getting together in a shield wall, wall uh, ready to fight back. And the battle starts. The English here on the next scene have a good position on top of the hill, Semlak Hill. Some people call it the Battle of Semlak. They knew it was a good position because they knew that the Normans had to run up the hill to get to them. And the English were fighting well because they stayed in a group and they stayed in their shield wall. The battle carried on viciously and the English were winning at one point because they thought William had died. And here you see him taking off his helmet and saying to his men, I'm still alive, finish it. And they do. Some of the English break um, out of line, rush down the hill, thinking they can finish off the Normans. But that was the biggest mistake they could. One by one got knocked off until only Harold himself was left with a few men to protect him. And here we see him in this scene with um, an arrow in his eye which legend says how he died but it right next to him he probably did get an arrow and then he was struck down by a sword the english flee their leader has um, died so they flee the country and go back to their homes and wonder what's next the normans get their army together they make their way around the coast pillaging killing until word gets back to all the lords in England what was going on. And in fear, they offer him the keys of London and say, the country is yours. And on Christmas Day in 1066, he's crowned William I of England. The English look in awe to wonder what is in store for them. In October the 14th, 1066, the Battle of Hastings, King Harold lay dead. William had accomplished a truly astonishing feat. The conquest of a rich, well-organised kingdom with the minimum of bloodshed. The face, character and structure of England were radically altered by the Norman conquest. Whether for better or worse, no one can say. King Harold II, the last Anglo-Saxon King of England, he ruled for less than a year from January the 5th, 1066 to the day of his death on the 14th of October. The death of a king in a battle was rare in medieval times, so it's only fair to mention him in respect in this piece of English history. Edith Swanneck brought Harold's body back to Waltham Abbey. It was here in his lifetime that he was Lord of the Manor, and it was only right that this was the place he would have liked to be buried. 
It was difficult to identify the body because a lot of the heads have been cut off, arms, etc. But she went out and she identified his body by marks that she knew was actually left on his body. The next scene shows Wolfram Abbey where they believe his body was taken back. But up in the corner, I've embroidered Bosham because there's a rumour that he was also buried at Bosham or maybe even survived the battle, which is very unlikely. There are several rumours, but one is he was buried at Waltham Holy Cross, the other was at Bosham. The next one is a poet written by someone. She searched and toured the lifelong day until the night was nigh. Then sudden from her breast there burst a shrill and awful cry. For in the battlefield at last his body she had found. She kissed without a tear or word the wan face on the ground. She clasped him close and pressed her lips to the bloody wounds that gaped upon his breast. His shoulders stark, she kisses too. When searching, she discovers three little scars her teeth had made when they were happy lovers. The monks had been and gotten bells, and of the bells they made, a simple beer upon the corpse of the fallen king was laid. To Waltham Abbey, to his tomb, the king was thus removed and Edith Swanneck walked by the body that she loved. And the last picture is what we believed William the Conqueror looked like William the First by the end of 1066. He was King of England.